So thank you. So thanks everyone for uh, coming to our talk today here. So um, we are gonna find out what a pipeline and a spacecraft so have in common and how we can apply that to the design of our pipelines. Now it's working, yeah, thank you. So uh, my name is Israel, so I work at the Google Cloud in the professional services team as a data engineer. I help our customers trying to extract the highest performance out of uh, data flow. And my name is Paul Baum. Um, I'm in the, the same role as uh, Israel, as Israel uh, also based out of, uh, out of Madrid in Spain. Um, <clears throat> and um, like, we, uh, like we said, um, we'll be talking about uh, the similarities between uh, Apollo missions and, um, and data pipelines. Um, so this, uh, this talk is inspired by uh, this uh, talk that you can find on, on YouTube, which is called Light Years Ahead, about the 1990, uh, 1969 uh, Apollo guidance computer by Robert Wills. Um, so Apollo 11, it's about Apollo 11, uh, which is the, uh, the first Apollo mission to actually land on the, on the moon. And um, it, it did this, this uh, first moon landing, uh, mainly guided by the Apollo guidance uh, computer. So uh, this is it, this, uh, this copper box is the, uh, the, Apollo, um, the Apollo guidance computer. Um, it was able to, uh, to, to guide the uh, lunar landing module module that you see in the other uh, in the other image approaching the, the, the moon surface with two uh, two astronauts inside um, it was able to guide this this uh, this lunar module through a series of complex operations in an unpredictable environment and obviously it had to do this very very reliably so how is it able of, of, of achieving that uh, goal um, so the software that this uh, this guidance computer was running. It was designed with um, with a number of uh, design principles in mind, um, and these design principles make it so that uh, that the software that this computer is running um, uh, it, it's uh, it's very uh, it's very reliable. Um, so. Um, it was able to, to land the lunar module on, uh, on the moon. Um, and, and let's see on the, on the next slide what, um, what this has to do with, uh, with, with data pipeline. So a pipeline, is it a spacecraft? Well, when you launch a pipeline, once it's already launched, you have very limited control over it, just like in a spacecraft. In order to be able to know what's going on with your pipeline, so you need to have observability. And if you don't prepare for that, the amount of observability that you will have will be very limited. And well, if you make a mistake, especially in the cloud, it may cost you some money. So just like an spacecraft, okay? So you just craft and you launch it, so it's gonna be really expensive. Yes, over to you. No, no, oh, no, here. So, so, so this is this is a pipeline. So, so we have some transformations. So we have input and output for sure, one or more. We have some amount of control depending on the runner. This might be just let's say cancel the pipeline or let it uh, uh, keep going. And you may have metrics. You may observe what's going on in your pipeline. So this is really very similar. Uh, to a spacecraft, the pipeline runs by itself and you have very little possibilities of intervention. Maybe you can put some probe in the input to see how the pipeline reacts and what's the output to try to diagnose what's going on with your pipeline. But that's it. So once it's launched, the pipeline is on its own and, and we can hope for the best, but hope is not a strategy. To overcome these problems, the software for the Apollo computer was designed using some principles, some design principles that we can apply to our uh, pipelines. Let, let, let's review what these principles are. All right. So um, let's go back to the to the um, Apollo mission and and to see what it um, what it had to do. Um, so on this uh, on this slide, there is a there is a diagram with the uh, moon in the middle and the and the outer circle. It's the it's the orbit of the 
uh, of the control module that stays in that orbit and then off separates the lunar landing module that is going to approach the moon and actually um, actually land. So this is clearly not to scale because the, the height of the of the orbit is about uh, 20 miles or something and the, and, the, and, the, and the radius of the or the diameter of the moon is like 2,000 miles. Um, but you can see that um, um, that the, 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 what, the, what the lunar module has to do is it has this massive, um, this massive rocket engine that is pointing, uh, pointing forward that the Apollo guidance computer is going to have to fire and, and, and uh, control like the, where, the, where the lunar module is and its speed and control it in a very uh, uh, reliable way um, so that it follows the pre-planned trajectory that it has calculated and it and it and, and the landing occurs on the on, on the coordinates that um, that it is continuously uh, predicting and that the astronauts can um, uh, can update so if you want to do all these these kinds of calculations what you need to do are a lot of vector and matrix operations um, but the Apollo guidance computer it's programmed in its own uh, assembly language um, with its own uh, proprietary 1969 uh, instruction set. Um, so you cannot do things, for example, like have an array and uh, index the array, like access a certain element in, in an array. So try to do a, a, a matrix multiplication with, uh, with that. So to be able to implement uh, the, the, the programs that they need to uh, execute, uh, you, need a, you need a higher level um, uh, language than the assembly that the, the computer runs natively. Um, so they implement actually, they implemented an interpreter to run on this, uh, on this thing that allows uh, to, to work in a higher level language and achieve the, the mission goals. So if we want to apply this, this principle to, um, to a beam pipeline, how would, we, how would we do it? Well, so use a hybrid language. How do we apply this to our pipelines? In BIM, you have SDKs in many different languages. So Apache BIM is actually already a language in itself. It's a high-level domain-specific language to implement complex distributed computing operations. Imagine that we, we wouldn't have this. So it would be very difficult to try to make the kind of distributed computations that we do in, in, a, in a pipeline. But here we're going to talk about a different thing. So, so the BIM SDKs in, in different languages, and even though not all of them have exactly the same coverage of all the features, like for instance, in input output connectors, not all the SDKs have the same, the same connectors, right? It's a discrepancy between different SDKs. But even though that, the recommendation here will be, let's say, use any language. Uh, use the language that better suits your use case, okay? And if you are missing anything, you have the possibility to run cross-language pipelines, if you have a, a supporting grain, and there are, there are several uh, of those. So uh, before we go to the next uh, uh, principle, check out the program, because there's a very nice workshop on cross-language pi pipelines on Wednesday, if I recall well, and I, I recommend you'd like to have a look at that, because with that, you are, you're going to be able to choose whatever high-level programming language suits you better, and to be able to use Bean. So you, you, you will not be forced to use a language you are not familiar with. All right, so let's let's have a look at the um, at the second uh, second principle. The second principle that the uh, designers of the Apollo guidance computer um, uh, followed was to divide your program into jobs, which is kind of strangely to me it sounds like a very modern um, modern idea. Um, uh, what this so what this uh, so so let me give you an example how this how this principle was actually helping them to achieve. Uh, to to uh, to achieve the moon land. Um, so this device that I'm showing on the on the slide over here is called the Disky. Um, it's the it's the user interface to the computer that the astronauts had in the in the in the moon land. So it's very limited. You can punch a couple of like three different commands and a, uh, and the codes that go with the, uh, with the commands. And what you can see on this on this user interface is a a red light uh, lighting up. Um, uh, is uh, a red light lighting up, 
and uh, the number 1202, which is, uh, which mean, which is a, uh, means that it's a, a 1202 programming error. Um, so what was, what was going on here? So we're in the, in the, uh, in the, in the lunar model, in the, in the landing module. The landing module has separated from the, from the command module, and it's, a, it's like descending towards the, uh, towards the surface. And uh, Buzz Aldrin, who was the, the pilot of the landing module, he requested the computer to calculate and to continuously update and tell him what the coordinates were for the current predicted landing site. So this effectively, it runs a, it runs a job on the, uh, on the computer. Um, and um, when he did this, he was getting these, uh, these alarms. So how does the, um, uh, how does the, the, the computer deal with this? Well, it basically, it kills, uh, uh, it kills all the jobs and, uh, and restarts them. So that's how, but it, it only restarts the, the, the essential ones, such as the actual, like the actual control of the, of the rocket engine that I talked about earlier. The, the lunar modules has a bunch of uh, little uh, rockets, let's say, called thrusters to keep it uh, pointing in the right direction. Um, so it restarts those those jobs and it's able to cover like a working uh, working scenario, thus aiding the uh, the reliability of the um, of the system. So it, it saved the, uh, the 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 mission at this point because it was the computer was being overloaded. Um, the question is, can we use this principle to save our pipelines as well? Well, I think we can. So dividing the program into jobs. So how this apply to to a pipeline? Because a pipeline will run one job, okay? So, but it's actually it's actually not not done. So a job is an instance of a pipeline, so that's obvious. But within a pipeline, how do you design the pipeline matters? We will have a series of complex pipeline operations with different relations between them that we can aggregate together. So uh, in Apache Beam, we have P transforms, and, and P transforms are just mm, like um, we could even call it syntactic sugar. They don't have any kind of semantic impact on the pipeline. We could have the same pipeline implemented with P transforms or without. It's just a matter of organizing things together. Okay, so if you group your uh, your transforms, your code into P transforms, you're gonna make it easier to understand what your pipeline is doing. And if you pay attention on how to design these P transforms, you will be able to make them reusable. So a P transfer will be a reusable component for your pipelines or even for third party pipelines. Check out the, the, the Apache Bean uh, uh, documentation. The, there is a style guide for P transforms. And it's, it, it's not just, let's say, like a picky recommendation of uh, how you should uh, do things. It's, the idea is how to make your P transforms reusable so, so you can improve the design of your pipelines. All right. Um, so that that helps uh, to to make your 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 pipelines more uh, more maintainable. Um, so let's look at another um, at another uh, design principle. Um, so uh, imagine this: uh, you are in uh, your name is uh, Neil Armstrong. You're in a little metal uh, box in the void of space, uh, hurtling towards the the moon surface. Your pilot is looking at this disky that we we're, uh, were looking at before, which was saying uh, program error 1202, uh, computer overloaded. And, um, uh, and the, the, the way that uh, the, 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 the computer deals with this is to restart the jobs. So this is the, the other uh, design principle to restart on, on failure, which in this point in time, you may not be so, uh, so, so uh, enthusiastic about. Um, but the fact is that, you know, in a, in a space environment, in many industrial settings, in cloud computing as well, um, the environment that, you're, that you're, your jobs are running in, so let's think about uh, cloud computing, like the, the, the network environment, the, the hardware, the specific uh, interactions with other uh, components in, the, in all the devices that are, uh, that are involved. It's an environment that uh, has a, a very uh, large space of different uh, configurations, different things that can happen or different things that can go wrong. And, um, and it's, it's uh, 
it's it's very hard to test all these uh, these these, uh, these these circumstances. But what is for sure is that if you uh, that if you uh, restart and and just try again, then it's not that likely that your um, that the same circumstance will will happen again. So restarting or failure is actually um, a, a technique that um, uh, that uh, that allows the, the the system to be much more uh, reliable. Now you may be wondering what has this image uh, to do with this with this concept. Uh, not very much, to be honest. <laughs> um, but I find this a mind-blowing picture. This is the, um, the on the on the left we see the, uh, the 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 ROM memory, which is where all the programs were uh, programmed. So this is called uh, magnetic core rope memory, and the way you program it is by you put a, uh, you have to put all the zeros and the ones into this memory, and the way you put a one is to pass um, uh, a line through the or a a wire through a hole, and if you don't pass it through the hole, it's a zero. Um, so on the on the right side, you see uh, you see a lady working on, uh, on 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 programming this memory and putting the storing the uh, the, the programs in the uh, in into the memory. So okay, um, restarting on failure. Um, hopefully, this is uh, this is easy to apply to your pipelines. Is that is that true? Well. The runner, for sure, when they say worker or a bundle of data that is failing for whatever reason, will restart things. Okay, so so this is the default behavior of of a, of many runners. Um, but sometimes you may need to do more things like this. Okay, so you may have already a job running and you may want to do uh, updates to the code. Uh, so your job needs to be designed in a way that it doesn't matter if it's killed and relaunch and it's gonna process the input twice. Okay, so you you should you should design your pipeline in a way that that supports gapless processing. Okay, that is safe to run the same job again, and this is even more crucial in a streaming. In batch, you can always start over. Okay? You can like, well, if you have a way to identify what's the output of your job and you can drop that, just read from the input again and start over, well, so you are safe. And in batch, well, so this is more or less doable. But in streaming, this is really not, uh, not, so, not so easy, not so easy to, to, to achieve. Okay? So, so if, if you try to, to, to design for gapless processing, it's going to be very, it's gonna be easier to like to overcome this principle. So um, the advice that we're giving here is more focused on the case of uh, of data flow. Uh, for instance, in the second part, like considering draining versus canceling uh, a pipeline. So uh, draining uh, it means that you will be fully processing all the data that you have already flying throughout the pipeline, like the watermark will be push to infinity, all the windows will be closed, all the data that was inside those windows will, will be processed, the output will be written, etc. Okay. Whereas if you are canceling, anything that is currently not fully processed will just stop. Okay. And then you will have data losses. Okay. So uh, canceling a pipeline, it's faster, but uh, you will lose uh, data. Um, Another way to try to overcome this is running some kind of parallel updated pipeline or also replaying the messages, like getting the input, like recirculated to some output and then trying to, to uh, replay from, from this, uh, from this uh, uh, another input, okay? Um, so if, if you want to know more about these strategies, uh, I, I recommend you a couple of links. There's this very nice guide about running data flow production, uh, pipelines in production. A lot of the advice is, well, of course, focus on the case of the data flow running, but it has also very generic advice that can be applied to many other Apache Beam pipelines. And when you are designing your job for resilience to be able to be restarted and so on, one crucial aspect of this is error handling. There's a very nice talk I don't remember exactly when, I think it's tomorrow, and uh, about the Asgard library, which I recommend you. So if you're using Java with Apache Bean, you, and you want to apply this kind of principles, you will be kind of always writing the same chunks of code, the same patterns over and over. And this library 
simplifies a lot the writing of this and it will make your pipeline more concise and easier to understand. Okay. Um, so um, in the um, in the final phases of, of descent to uh, to the to the lunar surface, uh, so we're we're getting really close now, um, and this computer is continuing to to launch its uh, I'm overloaded uh, errors. So I uh, I bet a few uh, drops of sweat were spilled there. Um, what the computer is doing is it's uh, it's continuously uh, uh, it's continuously restarting. Um, so um, it needs to uh, uh, surely the, the the astronauts in the in the lunar module they'll be happy if these restarts if they can be you know they can be quick. Um, so it's a good thing that this computer is not uh, is not running Windows ninety five. It's running Windows sixty nine. Um, and what this operating system uh, implements is checkpointing good state. Okay. Um, so, for example, how does this uh, how does it apply this uh, this this principle? Um, what you see here is a, a device called the uh, the inertial measurement uh, unit, which uh, is a device called a, a gimbal. It has like the uh, something in the center that stays exactly uh, in the same orientation always independently of how you uh, rotate the, the, the spacecraft around. So what you can do is you can read out a bunch of sensors sitting on the, on the outer casing, and you can find out how the, uh, uh, how the, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the spacecraft is oriented. You, you run your, your job with your matrix uh, operations, and you get the answer. Um, what happens when you need to, when you need to restart? you would need to run, rerun this job and wait until it completes and you get the, the spacecraft orientation. So this is where the, where the checkpointing uh, of good state comes in. You run this calculation, you save the, 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 the last known, uh, the last known uh, result. Um, and when the computer comes back up, you reload the, the checkpointed data to, you know, to, to be back up in time before we hit the, the, the lunar surface. Um, so in Beam, I would like this, this, this quick recovery too, because you know the time that my, my pipeline is up, it costs me money. Um, so how can I uh, how can I achieve this this behavior in Beam? Well, in some runners, you can actually do checkpoints. Okay, so for instance, in data flow, if there is a shuffling of data, there will be a checkpoint happening. Okay. You can try to leverage this to make your pipeline more resilient to failure. Any error in a data flow pipeline will be restarted or the process from the latest checkpoint. Okay. For instance, this is really very handy when you are doing input and output. If you are pulling data from an input, an error happens. You don't want to go back to the original input and pull the data again. Okay, so because that's going to be a slow operation. So you can checkpoint the data to try not to pull the same data again. So when you're doing a shuffling, because you're doing a transformation that requires a shuffling, perfect. But sometimes you will not have an excuse to make a shuffling. But you can still force one. They say a transform in Apache Beam that is called reshuffling. And in the Java API, a API is actually marked as deprecated. deprecated. I don't think it's deprecated. It's probably more runner dependent. It's kind of like a runner dependent behavior that has leaked into the Apache Beam model somehow because not all the runners work in the same way for, for, for the transform, okay? But uh, it may be useful in, in some scenarios. And, and in other tools, like for instance, in the case of scalability in data flow, it's also used to break fusion and to force auto-scaling of your job. So use reshuffling and shuffling when you need to do checkpointing if the runner that you're using supports that. There are several runners supporting that. All right, that's, that's great. Um, so, um more uh, more principles to 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 achieve the the amazing uh, the amazing uh, reliability that that uh, you require if you're um, if you're on a space mission. Um, so this is uh, Margaret Hamilton from from uh, MIT standing next to the listings of all the of all the programs running on the 
um, on the on the command module and on the on the lunar landing module that she uh, contributed to. So she was awarded the Presidential Medal of Freedom in uh, 2016. So that's actually 46 years after uh, after this picture. It's a good thing she was young when she was uh, working <laughs> on it. She, she wouldn't have made it. Um, so um, this uh, this source code is what you had to program into the um, into the memory, like in the uh, in the uh, in the image that uh, we saw earlier. Uh, the code itself is now uh, publicly available on uh, on GitHub on the on the repo that you can uh, uh, that you can uh, see over there. It doesn't have the full uh, history, but people have worked on it for uh, somehow for like two years after the initial commit fixing typos and. Uh, um, so this software, um, it's the, the operating system that implemented uh, something called uh, collaborative real-time uh, multitasking. Um, and in 1969 for an OS, um, uh, the, what this meant was that you're running uh, multiple jobs and what these, these jobs have to do, each one has to have in the, in the code a check every 20 milliseconds in the case of the Apollo guidance computer to check if any other uh, job wants to run. Um, so if any other job wants to run, that's where the collaborative aspect comes, comes in. It needs to, uh, to let it go, right? It needs to uh, seed and uh, let the other job run. So, um, so that way we can, uh, we can have our real-time uh, guarantees and make sure that we execute on according to the, to the specs and get the results when we, when we need them. But what happens if uh, something unexpected happens? A job gets stuck, it sits in an infinite loop or something like that, and it never actually checks in again uh, if another job wants to run. So this is when the, when the, when the hardware comes in, which has its own hardware uh, timeout. Uh, when after, I forget exactly how long, but after a few hundred milliseconds, uh, a job has not checked uh, for another job that wants to run again. Uh, it restarts the, the, the thing through, uh, and it, it, it finds out because the hardware monitors the, uh, the software. But um, if you're running uh, beam pipelines in a cloud system, now we have to worry about hardware if you want to apply this principle. How does it work easily? Well, you don't have to worry exactly uh, about hardware. So we are in 2022 already, and, uh, but we need to worry about monitoring in our pipeline and here hardware may have also an impact what are the expectations for our pipeline in terms of business so when we are running the pipeline in the cloud so we will have lots of metrics but metrics alone are useless so we need to be able to define a slo a service level objective and with that we will be able to offer some kind of service level agreement with the business for instance one slo could be related about data freshness 90% of product recommendations should be based on activity that is no older than three minutes. This could be an SLO. Or we could have SLOs around data correctness. In each calendar month, no more than 0.5% of the invoices should contain any errors. These are uh, service level objectives that we can try to implement. Or like load balancing data isolation. Within each business day, all high priority payments should be processed within 10 minutes whatever, okay? Data flow by using monitoring allows you to set these SLOs and set others and, and, and to be aware of what kind of level you can offer to your business. So in order to offer an SLA to your clients, to like to the business who is paying for the pipelines, you need to set and, 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 and define these SLOs. Um, and this should be the first step in designing your pipeline. You should start with this, okay? So not, not with, the graph of transformations that you are that you are making. If you have a look at the SRE uh, books, so these are uh, systems reliability engineering books from Google. Uh, there are very interesting uh, chapters there in in two of the books, in the in the original book and in the workbook around uh, uh, data pipelines and about uh, what's the experience of Google uh, running these pipelines and setting SLOs and. Uh, uh, SLS, okay, and with practical advice for, for data pipelines in general. So I strongly recommend you checking out these, these resources to learn how to start always the design of your pipelines by setting the SLOs. Cool. 
Um, okay, so um, this is a, a familiar uh, image, I think. Um, so this is again the the twelve oh two program error um, that that came from the from the disk key that the the astronauts were looking at, and uh, they're seeing these errors. They are uh, close to uh, they're in a very critical uh, situation to say the least. And you need to make one fundamental decision, which is go or no go. Do I abort or do I not abort? So how do you make this um, this this decision? So this is uh, a decision that they make based on uh, information that comes from uh, people like this lady over here. Um, she's in uh, in uh, the mission control center uh, on the ground in uh, in Houston. Um, and these people, they uh, can make these decisions because they have much more information about what's going on. Why do they have much more information about what's going on? That's because the Apollo guidance computer, um, the, 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 the information that it provides is not the only thing. Uh, it's not, not just what is uh, shown on the, on the UI in the, in the lunar module. It actually sends uh, periodically a data frame with um, a whole bunch of uh, of status numbers like current speed of the of the of the module, the current orientation, the the, the predicted landing site, and so on, um, to uh, mission control on the ground in Houston, and Houston is able to uh, to uh, to to analyze this data, see that you know the the primary processes that uh, are going to guarantee a, a safe landing are still running. And they tell the the astronauts that they can they can go and there's no need to to abort. Which, by the way, abort it's not like aborting would be a very safe uh, procedure. So it's not like a, uh, we, we're 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 playing with uh, we're, we're taking like a major risk by not aborting. Aborting was very risky also. Um, so the the moral of this story is you need to send uh, telemetry so that. Uh, the person observing the the the, the pipeline can uh, the, uh, your or observing your spacecraft um, can uh, can can know what's going on. So let's try to um, apply this to a beam pipeline again. So how how do you do this with a beam pipeline? Um, we have seen in the previous principle that we have hardware or cloud related metrics, but that would only get you that far. Okay, so some of your SLOs may be related to those, but many will be probably not related to that. The beam programming model supports three types of metrics, counter, distribution, and engage. Not all of those are supported for every running, uh, by every runner. Check out the capability metrics because there are differences between, between the runners. But, but I think counters, for instance, are supported in all the runners. Um, these metrics are normally integrated with the runner. So if you're using Spark, Flink, Dataflow, whatever, so they're all integrated with the dashboards, the monitoring dashboards of Spark or Flink, in the case of Dataflow with the monitoring modules of the platform, of Google Cloud Platform. So these custom metrics are calculated inside the transfers of your pipeline. So they have visibility about what's going on inside your pipeline. So this could be, for instance, if you are calling an external service, latencies calling to these external services. This is very difficult to observe from outside the pipeline. So you need information from inside the pipeline. So this is where metrics come handy. And you can have, for instance, a distribution of the latencies, the maximum, the minimum, the average, and so on. From the runner perspective, um, uh, there are some metrics that are also defined uh, or provided by default. Like some lots of counters are provided by default, how many elements you are processing. Okay? By combining these and your custom metrics, so you can define really very rich uh, SLOs, okay? So this is a very powerful way to set the expectations about your pipeline, okay? Without having to leak any kind of low level metric to your business. They're not interested on that. They're interested in high level metrics. So, so I think this is a very, very important principle to apply. Use metrics to uh, offer high level, met um, high level insights to your business uh, users. All right. Um, that um, brings us to our uh, to our conclusion. Um, so um, let's uh, recap for a moment the, the, the principles that we have uh, that we have covered so far. Um, so first one, 
uh, use a high level uh, language. Um, so one of the first uh, one of the first decisions that we have to take when implementing a pipeline in Beam is to choose the programming language that uh, that you want to use for your uh, for your pipeline. So the recommendation is to choose the best for your specific uh, situation, and if uh, that means implementing in a in a in a in a language that is missing one specific feature, then you can use the uh, uh, you can use the cross language uh, pipelines to uh, to 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 leverage that feature from uh, from another uh, from another language from another SDK. Second principle: divide and conquer. Um, don't expose the complete uh, complexity of your pipeline, which will be hard to understand and hard to debug if one if, if an error occurs in a in a in a in a specific uh, processing step. Use P transforms to bring some order and some uh, some maintainability to your uh, to your code, and compose your your pipeline using the the P transform. Uh, uh, a component so that will be easier to read easier to diagnose the problems easier to debug um, and and you you may even be able to reduce those components those more complex components in in future pipelines um, so principle three shit happens uh, restart on on uh, on failure prepare your pipeline for this for these these unforeseen consequences because they will they will come um and uh they will come at uh, any time when you just read the data just before you uh you you wanted to write the data at any point in time your your vm can uh, disappear or anything unexpected can happen so prepare your pipeline for that and make sure that your that the design and your implementation of your pipeline allows uh, this gapless uh, processing that 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 we desire and that allows the safe restarting of your of your pipeline. Uh, checkpointing. Um, so shuffling and uh, reshuffle transforms, they can, uh, in, in many cases, they will lead to uh, the, de depending on the, on the runner specific, so make sure that uh, you understand the behavior of the runner that you're, that you're using. It can create the, cause the runner to, uh, to create a checkpoint, which uh, will uh, be uh, then uh, faster to, to return to. And for a runner with auto scaling like data flow, um, a checkpoint also creates um, a barrier for uh, for backtracking in case of reprocessing failures, which is useful for IO uh, connectors. But uh, but not only that, because it can also break uh, fusion, which is a feature in uh, in in data flow where uh, different maps, for example, they can be brought together in one operation. But then what happens if for one specific shard uh, your uh, the, the operation is very long. Maybe you want to break it apart so that you can uh, can rebalance the load. Okay. Um, so that's that's an important uh, principle as well. Um, now, actually, principle five, but the first step in uh, what should be uh, the the design of your design considerations of your uh, of your pipelines is to say what is it that I what is it that I need to achieve with this pipeline. So choose um, an SLI, a service level indicator, which is like the metric that you want to measure. Set the SLO, the service level objective, which is the like if, if it's uh, accuracy or whatever, uh, the, the the level of accuracy that you want to uh, uh, that you want to achieve, and um, make the service level agreement with the business that are going to rely on your on the data that you're producing to uh, to. Uh, to set the, the the right expectations, and you can design your your pipeline accordingly. Um, apply the SRE uh, principles, the Site uh, Reliability Engineering uh, uh, book from Google uh, on on this. Um, and finally, uh, uh, your uh, your uh, the final principle is to uh, to send uh, telemetry. Um, so um, your runner and your input-output systems, they will provide a bunch of very hand, uh, handy uh, metrics that will help to measure whether you're uh, meeting the, the, the obligations under your, uh, under your, SL, uh, your SLA. Uh, they will help you uh, with uh, uh, debugging. 
So your, your runner, they, they will provide like low level uh, metrics, but don't li uh, limit yourself to, to those and use the features that are existent in, uh, in Beam to also uh, define the more higher level uh, uh, metrics with, uh, with, with uh, business. Um, so that would be like the, the distribution of latencies, for example, like the, uh, based on uh, the, the calls from, uh, to, to an external service. For example. Um, all right. So, well, so th thanks all for for your attention in this talk. Pipelines are spacecrafts, kind of. Okay. So your pipeline has to land successfully too. Okay, like an sp a spacecraft. So although hoping for the best is not a strategy, you should not apply hope just in your pipelines. So we actually hope that these principles are useful and fruitful for, for you in, in the design of your pipelines. Check out the links that we provide here um, to learn more about uh, the principles that we have that we have presented here. Okay, so the first link is this uh, data flow guide that I told you about. So it's specific about data flow, but it contains a lot of advice around Apache Beam pipelines in general as well. For sure, the Beam documentation should be like your number one uh, source of uh, information for, for, for Apache Beam. Um, there are art articles about creation, pi creating your pipelines, designing pipelines, testing your pipelines that are really useful to be able to apply these uh, principles successfully. And also don't forget about the SRE books, okay? So this is more generic about advice around data pipelines, but it's also something that you should take into account when you are designing your pipelines. I think those are must read for anyone doing data pipelines with Apache Beam. So that's all. Uh, thank you very much for your Attention.